welcome to Barbatos Catholic Podcast, the show where three Mexican dads talk about faith, life, and culture. We are your hosts, Gustavo, Ivan, and Walter. And today we are going to tell you about a few things that you should be thankful for. But first, a word from our sponsor. Tacos, tacos, tacos. Now that I have your attention, did you know that hashtag Taco Tuesdays doesn't just have to be on Tuesdays? You can make it hashtag taco every day with Don Taco Mobile Taco Stand. If you're looking for the best tacos in the valley, look no further. Let Don Taco cater your next event, whether it's a birthday party, baby shower, quinceañera, or a wedding. It will bring you the most delicious tacos with the freshest of ingredients. Do you like tacos de birria? They got them. Tacos de asada? Treat yourself. Tripas, cabeza? Guys, they got them. Book them today. Go to dontacocatering.com for more information. You can also follow them on Instagram at Don Taco MTS. And now to the show. A few things that you should be thankful for. I mean, that was, that was a good one. Yeah, it's true. <laughs> it is. It's true. I mean, I don't know about you, but a lot of the things that we're going to talk about today, I I have taken for granted. But. It's like mm-hmm. you're welcome, Earth. Yeah, you're welcome, Earth. You're work. You're welcome, world. Yeah, um, you're welcome, humanity. <laughs> <laughs> Sorry. Anyways, uh, welcome to the podcast. Uh, coming to you live from Studio A. Uh, today we are enjoying a um, couple uh, Trappist beers from Chimay, all the way from um, Belgium. So. Cheers to Cheers. Um, whatever monks did for for us. You are yeah. truly doing God's work. <laughs> Actually, Ivan, the one that we had before, the Sank Sense, mm-hmm. that's a triple. Mm-hmm. And um, and then right now we are enjoying uh, Chimay Grand Reserve, which is the blue one. Mm-hmm. Um, very good beer. Copper brown beer. Has a light creamy head, slightly bitter. Um there, there's some people that think that Belgian beers, the the yeast that gets used for those beers tastes like banana, mm. mm-hmm. which it's kind of weird to think about, like drinking a beer and it tastes like banana. But I can totally see it. Mm-hmm. There's a German beer that I that I really like called I don't know how to pronounce it, but it's A Y I N G E R, like Anger, something like that. Anger, Anger, and it's a German beer. Mm-hmm. It's more being more like Anger. 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 <laughs> Probably. <laughs> that sounds more <laughs> that sounds more accurate. Um but on the even on the the like the, the notes like on the bottle it says like you're you'll get hints of notes mm-hmm. of this and that and it says banana. Oh, there you go. Interesting. And it does have kind of like a banana aftertaste. It's really good. Not really into German beers other than whatever comes out of Oktoberfest, like Marsen type. Mm-hmm. See, I love Hefe's. Oh, Hefeweizen, sorry. I forget that Hefeweizen is German. That's my go-to, man. Hefeweizens are, I just, I, I don't know why, I just love. They're just so, like, citrusy sometimes and creamy. Mm-hmm, and mm-hmm, mm-hmm. We could make a complete oh, episode on this. Full episode. Full disclosure, Chimay is not a sponsor, but they could be. <laughs> <laughs> they could be. Call I just up. love that um, the in the bottle it says it has a, a picture of, like, the, what's the right glass that you should use for... Uh, pouring a chimay and it's a, a chalice looking glass so the the, the most um close things that i had we'll, we'll put a picture on it okay there you <laughs> go mm-hmm. uh you'll you'll see it it's it's it, they're cocktail glasses but still it, it does the trick um but b- before we get into the topic this week is uh thanksgiving and we mentioned in the intro that we're going to talk about things that should be thankful for but you know all three of us are Mexican, and uh, we, well, at least for myself, like, I was asking the end of this week, like, what do you want to do for Thanksgiving? Like, we usually go to, we get invited mm-hmm. to other people's houses to spend Thanksgiving. In unpopular opinion, I don't necessarily like Thanksgiving food. Like, I know, I've been right now, it's like, I feel like our... All right, third kinda, fight. Gosh. Third fight. Third fight happening right <laughs> no now. No Christmas till December 25th. 
You don't like Thanksgiving food? No, no, Where no, am no, I? Like, okay, no wait, 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 wait. Where let me qualify. Right, let me right. qualify my. <laughs> let me qualify my statement. Okay. Well, I was about to get up and just. I'm like, about to jump across this table now. <laughs> <laughs> okay, like turkey, mashed potatoes, fine, but like green bean casserole, pretty tasty. So uh, good. You don't need it. So it's not essential. On. It's not essential. No, it's not one so, of those like, mm, I can't wait to have some green bean like, casserole. You're right. Exactly. With like Thanksgiving. <laughs> Yay. Green bean casserole. Woo. But you have to, you, I have to qualify my statement with like, I grew up not celebrating yeah. Thanksgiving. Like, yeah. The, mm-hmm. I, I've only okay, lived in the U.S. for 10 years and I, I, I don't care for it. I don't have like anything sentimental attached yeah. to Thanksgiving. Mm-hmm. But what did Thanksgiving look like? on your families dude everyone so a lot of people that know me they know that my parents are incredible cooks my dad obviously makes the best tacos in arizona i'm biased but yes we make the best tacos anyways people always ask me they say so do you guys like make tacos on thanksgiving and we're like no no we go go like the traditional thanksgiving meal turkey stuffing mashed Mm -hmm. potatoes I mean, cranberry you can't sauce. Chef, cranberry so sauce. It's mm-hmm. like kind of like his. Jam so, to but make they're like shook. They're like, but your parents are Mexican, right? It's like, yeah, but uh-huh. like my dad goes all out. And then sometimes uh, I'll make the turkey, or my brother in law will make the turkey, or we'll make the turkey together. But it's like we go traditional. Although we do have a lata de chiles jalapenos on the table because <laughs> you have to. Yeah. You my mom, to. my mom does it too. You know, it's like, yeah, turkey. Give me all the turkey and mashed potatoes, but si, mira, tengo gravy. <laughs> I have brown gravy and salsa verde. <laughs> <laughs> so we go traditional all the way. Yeah, me too. Nice. Mm-hmm. Yeah, Thanksgiving is the biggest uh, dinner that my mom cooks. Like, the I mean, your year. parents used to run a restaurant, so th- mm-hmm. both of your parents yeah. have been in the restaurant industry. Um, mm-hmm. But for my mom, that was like, it's like, I don't care what you do for Christmas. I don't care what you, you do for New Year's, but Thanksgiving, your butt better be here. You know? So really? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Up, up until a couple of years ago, uh, we would we would always spend things. My mom's turkey is like to die for. It. Nice. Um, but, you know, when, when your kids start growing and stuff like that, well, you're like, well, now we want to have those traditions. You know, I want to have the the turkey and the... Because when when I was growing up, it was all hands on deck. Everybody, we, was everybody did something. On the meal. Mm-hmm. Everybody yeah. was chopping or dicing or taking the innards out of the bird and like. So my mom's secret for like a really juicy turkey. Is Here we go, guys. She injects it with like the cheapest Mexican wine that you can find. I don't think they make it anymore. Presidente. No. Uh, what was it? Um, Pedro Domecq. No, it wasn't Pedro the Make. It was like ah, Padre Quino. Padre Quino. <laughs> yeah, dude. So now you know three brands of Mexican wine yeah. that are really cheap. You're welcome. So she welcome. she would she would buy a bottle of that and she would inject half of it into the turkey. But when it comes out, it's like juicy, so tender. You know what's another one? Gordon oh. Ramsay. I love Gordon Ramsay. He makes the his his he calls it a Christmas turkey, but obviously, like we'll make it yeah. for Thanksgiving. But the trick that he does is he makes a compound butter with like lemon zest and mm-hmm, mm-hmm, chives. Mm-hmm. And then he grabs like the butter and like stuffs it in between Inside the, the skin. skin. That's mm-hmm. how Caro does it. Mm-hmm. Yep. Dude. And then you put bacon on top of it, put it in the oven. It's like that. Dude. Tur bacon ducking. Oh, it's like the best turkey you'll have, yeah. bro. It's so good. Okay. Now I want to go to both of your places good. for Thanksgiving. Dude. <laughs> well, you're welcome. Exactly. You're I'm, welcome to it. It's because it's, it, for a family of six, with like we have small children that don't eat mm-hmm. those kind of foods. It's like yeah, yeah, it's yeah. wasted on on. No, we we'll go the kids. out. We we'll go all out. Now that you we're know? doing it by our, like on, in in our house is like the same. I when think. you're hosting, I get it, and maybe when the kids are older, I get it. But mm-hmm. I was telling you know like we need to start like what is our Thanksgiving yeah. tradition? Yeah. So what do you guys usually do? Um, you get, we invited. get invited to other oh, families. Got it, got it, got it. It's yeah, like yeah, yeah. shout out to the Buells uh, that have invited us uh, a couple times and wonderful time. It's fantastic because you just show up, eat, and mm-hmm. then <laughs> drink and be merry, you know? Yeah, but it's also wonderful to have leftovers for a week. That is true. That is you know, amazing. But the thing with turkey in Mexico, like we would do turkey for uh, New Year's, not Mm-hmm. Christmas because Christmas is tamales, obviously, yeah. um, or like um, 
pierna de cerdo. Pierna, uh -huh. How do you, it's ham. Just ham, ham. basically. Mm -hmm. But it was more like a pulled pork than a yeah. ham, but whatever. Um, and then one of my tias, the Novedosa, they wanted to start celebrating Thanksgiving because one of my cousin's birthday is on November 26th. Um, so funny story. The, the time, the November, uh, 2013, when I proposed to Diana, I proposed to her in Casa Madero. It's a winery in Mexico. And, um, we were in Monterrey around that time for Thanksgiving. And they were like, well, Diana's from the U S we should have a Thanksgiving dinner. We had turkey, <laughs> mm -hmm. but like the sides were like all over the place. You know, we had spaghetti and like mashed potatoes and like none of the typical ones. And Deanna was like, why, why are they serving spaghetti with, <laughs> with turkey? It's like, no la de pedo. It's just like <laughs> smile and eat, <laughs> smile and eat. It's fine. It's going to be fun. <laughs> and ever since then, it's like, it's like the, the butt of yeah. the joke. It's like, where's the spaghetti Yeah, with the, with the turkey? No, we, we go fully tread. Trad to traditional like your cranberry sauce from scratch. Gato's turkey is the best too. She just like stuffs it with like lemons and oranges and does the butter thing inside of the skin. She probably watched Gordon Ramsay. Oh video. my goodness, her her go to is like barefoot contessa. She's like dude, really barefoot big. contessa is like you put two sticks of butter <laughs> <laughs> inside of the butter, and you inside while while butter. eating butter, you melt butter and you drink it. <laughs> We're but that's why it gets so juicy. Uh, though. Hot buttered rum as a side. Yeah. Uh, it's like the, have you seen the huevo cartoons? I know. No. Como se el pavo de Navidad. No. <laughs> Le pone un... I kind of show it you. Yeah. Because of what he said <laughs> with, the, with the wine. But it's like, se toma usted de uno de tequila y le pone otro al pavo. Because that's how my mom prepared it. She took a, she took a shot and then they gave a shot to the oh, turkey of wine. <laughs> this is going to be even funnier. Anyways. Okay. <laughs> Just still laughing and thinking over the yeah. video. Uh, but, okay. Thanksgiving. Thankfulness. Things that we uh, are thankful for that sometimes we take for granted and that, oh, what a surprise. The Catholic Church is behind <laughs> all of these things. So, you're um, welcome, Earth. You're welcome, Earth. Gustavo pitched this, this episode, and I was like, yeah, let's do this. You know, Because every um, other Catholic podcast has it, so why not us? <laughs> I mean, this is, we're not saying that we're original. We're just like regurgitating things that we find online. And It's um, the same, but, but Mexican. Different. But different. Oh. <laughs> <laughs> I like that tagline better. Say it again. It's the same, but, but Mexican. Mexican. <laughs> um, let's take a sip of my, uh, my Chimay. See, like the second one that we record, we're like a little bit more like looser into it yeah right. so because i have to nerd out like ivan uh has said in the past i i already had a copy of how the catholic church built uh west civilization by thomas e woods jr and um it's a fantastic book and um hopefully this doesn't turn into drunk history of the church and <laughs> <laughs> by the, the, the rate that we're going but here we go okay um <clears throat> most of the stuff that um that we took for this episode comes out of chapter three how monks save civilization and um you know it's no surprise that i am infatuated with the monastic yeah. tradition and benedict and gustavo and, and ivan are also big fans um but the monastic contribution to Western civilization, we have seen, it's, it's immense. And we're just going to go through some of the things that the monks did to preserve civilization. And mind you, I guess like the context of all of this is, you know, people are always portraying the Catholic Church as anti-science the dark ages they were promoting um mysticism mysticism like, instead of like science or that they were promoting like um, um illiteracy illiteracy so they can dominate people it's like okay so all of these things that we're going to tell right now if you're catholic you need to know how to defend that the, part of the faith the middle ages mm -hmm. right um and, and, and even the more that I'm listening to this book, I'm like, yes, like I just want to get into a debate with someone who is not Catholic. Just I quiero like, pelear. Or that somebody basically, that, dude, that it's basically is making me cocky, dude. I'm yeah. like, 
No más que alguien diga algo y van a ver. Um, you walk into a conversation where somebody says, says like in the Inquisition, yeah. right? Yes. Yeah. It's like, <laughs> well, you know, all the people that were like uh, tried in the Inquisition or they got killed because of a crusade or something. That was just like a Tuesday afternoon for Stalin, you know, while I'm, yeah. you know, drinking my cocktail. Yeah. And wanna, <laughs> but we'll, 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 we'll get to that maybe. <laughs> another episode. Another episode. Um, what did the monastic contribution to Western civilization did? So in, in, in kind of like the, the Middle Ages begin around the fifth uh, century after the fall of Rome, right? All of these barbarian tribes from Germany and all these places started Invading, moving into the, um, the cities and the geography where the Roman Empire used to be. And time and again, those guys were like, they were not messing around. Like their, their highest ideals were like very martial, very military. Like they were okay with killing and pillaging mm -hmm. and dominating, right? Which is pretty... Pretty much, you know, mm -hmm. barbarians. Um, but throughout that period of time, when um, that that was happening in Europe, monasteries were places where there was life in communion. They were self sustainable, and as part of that, the reason why they all were able to thrive and and pretty much outlive all of those things that were chaotic happening happening around um let's just start with the letter because i'm like getting ahead of myself um mm -hmm. so well, the, let, let, let me stop you real quick sure um rome fell because it couldn't keep up its own traditions and it fell into a debauchery and like mix of so many different things that they just lost their way in a sense and again benedict had the foresight to say I'm out of here. I just want to be a hermit. Yeah. You know, I just want to be alone to serve God. And God had other plans with him as, as we've touched on the podcast, but it's like you're going to be alone with 1200 of us. Exactly. <laughs> so again, Rome was like irrecognizable from what it was essentially. So one of the first things that um, we owe to the uh, monastic tradition is that the monks taught metallurgy. Which doesn't sound super sexy, right? Say like, oh, okay. It depends who you talk to. Well, that's true. That's true. If you're into that, I guess. Um, but every <laughs> monastery had its factory, and um, they would use these forges, these furnaces, to extract iron from ore. And the slag or the, the, the byproduct of the furnaces, they used it as fertilizer because it had a lot of phosphates ah. in it. Yeah. So... They were able to like fertilize their gardens and have um, a use for everything. Yeah. So, in in one part of the book, it says that they were so advanced with their technology when it came to furnaces that hadn't it been for Henry VIII suppressing English monasteries, the monks could have brought the world into the industrial era two and a half centuries Dude, early. That's crazy. That's crazy. I did not know that. They found um, uh, archaeologists or, like, I guess, um, historians found models of, um, like, monasteries, especially from the Cistercians, which is a Benedictine re Reformed tradition, that the, the olden furnaces in Europe, they wouldn't get too hot. So there was still a lot of iron in the slag mm -hmm. left. But the, the Cistercians, because they had like meetings every once in a while, that were they were able to like distribute knowledge of their technology and uh, be able to apply it in other monasteries that were like miles away from wow, each other. Wow. So it was like their Pretty own cool. like kind of internet <laughs> yeah, <that's laughs> in awesome. a way, low tech internet um, that they were able to innovate pretty quickly and share knowledge from all of these mm -hmm. the, this network of monasteries across Europe. Um, they introduced new crops wherever they came. They converted the wilderness into a cultivate, cultivated country. They drained morasses and cleared away forests. And and this is one of the things that if if you um, 
have we talked about like the 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 documentary the, the documentary silence i don't think so which it's about um a, an order of monks that they do everything in oh, silence i i saw mm. that one the the only time that they speak is uh, to pray is it the the one that they live in this island uh probably but they're all, they're in germany and it's like super cold They are in cells and they get their food through a little box. No, that's a different one then. Okay. I saw a different one. Um, well, the thing about the, uh, the the introducing new crops is like monasteries were a center of like agriculture. Like w without monks, agriculture as we know it wouldn't exist mm -hmm. because they had to be self-sufficient. They needed to make it work because they could only get like this very remote places in the middle of the woods they had to uproot trees and drain swamps in order to make it into fertile land mm -hmm. um so it was just like elbow grease and determination you know that they were just like wow, doing all these things to um to make uh food basically mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. did you know what food. some of those crops were um It doesn't say like exactly what it is, but they um, they probably have like um, more uh, detail in the actual chapter mm -hmm. that they talk about agriculture. But um, just the fact that they made an irrigation system out of a swamp to drain it and uh, and then make it fertile, because usually you know, in a swamp, when you think about it, like it's the water is stagnant, mm -hmm. and there's like death and putrid, yeah. putrid. And just to make there, there's like a quote uh, of someone describing like an area of England before the monks were there. And then like 300 years after, and before it's like, this is a putrid blah, blah, blah land. And then uh, 300 years later, after the monks were done with it, it was like, this is a counterfeit of paradise. Oh, wow. It's insane. Mm -hmm. um, and also, if, if you if you clump into that, like um, the breeding of cattle, um, monks were the ones that were like, let's not mm, put this to chance. Like they were trying to breed several different kinds of cattle to get a better kind of cow, goat, and whatnot um, that would be more resistant to the area where mm -hmm. they were living. Mm -hmm. But just like you start to think about it, it's like well, the Middle Ages. It's like I don't know about that, but it, there, there's no scientific advance. But yeah. they, they, these were like practical arts. Yeah, they needed to do it for, for surviving, for, for survival, yeah. for yeah. sustenance. Mm -hmm. Even the creation of cheese, you know, we owe some some cheeses, um, wine and beer too, right? Wine and beer, yes. Um, which fun fact: the wine they would make for. Uh, for celebrating mass for uh, altar wine and also for uh, celebrations. Um, and then beer would be made when there was a bad crop of grapes. Oh, just interesting. Yeah. Like beer was like second best thing that they could get. Mm. Uh -huh. <laughs> I'm blessing for it. <laughs> and also the Franciscans used to brew beer throughout mm -hmm. Lent because it wouldn't break their fast because it was a liquid fast. Oh, there you go. So they could celebrate St. Patrick's Day. I could get down with that fast, baby. Right? <laughs> yeah, exactly. When's Lent coming again? <laughs> um, all right. Don't worry, baby. I'm fasted. <laughs> I'm fasted. You're ridiculous. Um, they copied an ancient text. Um, one of the main things that... Um, monasteries would do would be um, taking manuscripts mm -hmm. and making copies out of it. And they, and they preserve both secular and religious works. Mm -hmm. um, they obviously the Bible, they're like really beautiful copies of the Bible in, in England that have like all this intricate um, imagery or like art um, with um, kind of like, Celtic mm -hmm. themes and whatnot built into it. Um, I have to, I don't remember the name of it, but I saw it and I was like, my goodness, if this is how Bibles look like, then <laughs> it's like, yeah, dude. it's like so cool. Um, but also 
and they were copying the work of like Aristotle, Aristotle, uh, Cicero, Lucan, Pliny, Statius, Trogus Pompeius, Virgil, all of these Greek greats mm -hmm. that were not necessarily Christian or Catholic, but they were like a good base for, uh, you know, Catholic thinking. Like, well, well, the barbarians did away with all a lot, a lot of that. When yeah. They, when they kind of like sacked, ransacked, and like pillaged, would burn everything, you know? Everything about the culture of uh -huh. the place where they were going. Yeah. So for the monks to do this, um, and, and people would kind of like, I'm kind of like paraphrasing, but they would say that it was very menial work, you know, and very uninteresting work and very uh, dumb work because you're just like copying and copying and copying and copying again. But thanks to them that's that's the the big reason that knowledge and literacy got preserved essentially because of all those copies which is the next point there you go they preserved literacy there's actually of some funny anecdotes that the author mentions in the book that the 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 copyists they put like some footnotes saying like to the reader of this book Please know that this copy was written by so and so on a dark and cold night, not allowed to write during the daylight, but being rushed to finish this book. <laughs> I was like, oh my goodness. that's very salty, but also like, let's let's pray for mm -hmm. for that monk that was forced <laughs> to work in the middle of the night um, by candlelight. By candlelight, it's probably the like eyesight was like shot. Can you imagine at twenty eight. Yeah, 28. <laughs> so they preserved literacy, um, especially with um, Charlemagne, um, which I didn't know there was such a big figure at St. Peter's. There's this sculpture of Charlemagne. And I was like, I don't understand why we have Charlemagne. But apparently he's like the the, the father of Europe, mm. as, as we know it, because um, he was converted to Catholicism, I believe. Um, and he was the one that, established cathedral schools where they would just go people would just go and be educated for free it's just like, like send today. my kid <laughs> basically um and obviously the the um the monks pioneer the idea of the university which is mm -hmm. totally ironic to think of the way that universities work right now versus Cheers what it was in there, which basically was a community of like teachers and students, not buildings. Mm -hmm. So like universities were like movable, mm -hmm. not like now. <sighs> so anyways, it's something to, to think about because really like if, when you hear about what would happen at universities, there would be like open discourses, like, Think about Thomas Aquinas, right? In the mm -hmm. Summa Theologiae, he has a question and he has uh, arguments against and arguments for, and then a conclusion. That used to happen at the universities back then. Mm -hmm. You would have a master that would just go and open into um, debate, debate with dialogue. anybody who would, who would go. And <clears throat> reason was like, the hallmark of uh, what would drive all of these discussions. Mm -hmm. Wouldn't that be great if we did that? Can you imagine that? Can you imagine that? <laughs> That's so foreign. It sounds so in, foreign. In current universe. I'm so glad I went to school in Mexico. <laughs> I mean, kind of same, but, you know, at the same time, it's like I graduated in 2006, and it was getting kind of iffy, not, not going to lie. Yeah, a little bit for me, but today is just like bonkers yeah um okay so what else they pioneered in te in technology um we talked about the cistercians um on top of like the metallurgy thing they um i think i don't know if they were the ones but they had they had water powered systems in their <clears throat> monastery so um it it they talk about it very poetically like the water comes from the stream and then comes and crushes the weave and then sieves the flower. 
and then <laughs> helps us make our clothing and all of these things and then goes into like foam and goes away and waters our fields and all these things i'm like that's very poetic but like yeah. they were really automating mm -hmm. all of the needs of the monks it's pretty amazing it's like thinking about nerding out the Cistercians were like very nerdy that's legit i right can there. tell <laughs> <laughs> i think you live in the wrong era walter oh totally uh, <laughs> you 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 got dropped in the wrong century here i have wondered that a couple of times mm -hmm. but you know it, it's like you said with the uh, uh, reading uh house on the prairie that pa had all of these mm -hmm. attributes uh, yeah. things that we needed to know in order for like totally self survival like, like we talked about um uh the movie with uh um yeah hidden life the hidden life mm -hmm. Families, that, that was commonplace, right? Mm -hmm. If you wanted to survive, you needed to be a farmer, live off the land. Basic um, needs. And now it's like, they didn't have the breakfast sausage in the order that I had from fries. Mm -hmm. You know, mm -hmm. <laughs> we're not going to have breakfast sausage. Yeah, like my Chick-fil-A is late. This, this, that dasher is not going to get his tip. <laughs> Jeez. Oh my goodness. Tip your dashes, please. Yeah. <laughs> More than 20%, <laughs> at least 20% of, or your food is going to be cold. Anyways, um, what else? They invented champagne. Dude. Like, you're welcome. Earth. What, you're welcome. What is the brand of champagne that you think of when you, when I say champagne? What's Dom, like the Dom brand Perignon. that you, Dom Perignon. Mm -hmm. Did you know that Dom Perignon was a Catholic monk? I did. Oh. I didn't know that. Yeah. So they used to call them Dom in, instead of like brother. Mm -hmm. And um, he was also a scientist. So he was like playing with the strands of yeast in his laboratory. <laughs> mm -hmm. So he just came up with a recipe for, for the yeast and out came this bubbly wine that mm -hmm. now um, is very celebratory. I, I like to clarify that. I only know that because Caro told me so. My wife is partial credit. Super amazing. Yes, um, he was part of Saint Peter's Abbey in France, if I'm not mistaken. Mm -hmm. So Don Perignon, uh, Catholic monk. They improved the European landscape. Um, this kind of related to the one about agriculture. They cleared out forests and marshes. They drained swamps. They created irrigation systems, um, and not. That they just like took stuff out, like they planted trees in, in they, they reforested mm -hmm. areas. They work with the land essentially. They didn't just come and chop trees trees down. Basically, mm -hmm. so if you see like the buildings of these monasteries in like France and Germany, mm -hmm. um, all over Europe, really, like um, the the landscaping in the campus, so to speak, of of like the monastery is like pristine they look amazing yeah yeah um they provided for wanderers of every stripe and, and this is just like one particular example at obrac france um there was a bell that they rang every night to call anyone who needed a place to stay because some people would, would get lost mm. at the forest and um and they would just like take people in that's so cool Because, you know, part of the Benedictine tradition is hospitality. Yeah. Um, see Jesus in every face. See Jesus. The, the, mm -hmm. Anyone who would visit the monastery would be treated as if Jesus was visiting Correct. the monastery. Mm -hmm. um, so there are accounts of, like, Spanish lords and whatnot going to several different monasteries around Europe, talking about, talking highly about Benedictines, like, how well they receive them. Um And they don't charge them for staying at the monastery or food. Like they, they feed them, they uh, take care of them, mm -hmm. send them on their way. Um, and, and that bell at uh, Albrecht in France, it, it was called the Bell of the Wanderers. Mm, so nice. they would just like go out to people 
to bring them in. Yeah. It's not just someone that was like knocking at the door trying to like see if they could spend That's theirs. Awesome. Like anybody there? <laughs> <laughs> um, they looked after the lost and shipwrecked. I thought it was pretty cool that in a monastery in Scotland, um, the abbots fixed a floating bell on a very notoriously treacherous rock on the Forfarshire coast. And the waves made the bell to, to sound, um, and this would warn sailors of the danger ahead. Um, to this day, can you guess what the place is called? Mm -mm. Bell Rock. Bell Rock. Ooh. There you go. <laughs> so, um, it, it, like, who else in the history of Western civilization can boast such a record? I mean, it, it's... We we didn't do any of this, but we kind of like belong to the organization that did all of this throughout the years. So it, it's, totally, it's a badge of honor. I think mm -hmm. it's a, it's a it's something that we need to take pride in, and very opposed to what it has been instilled in in people, right? Because and even in Catholics, like we become to accept, it, like oh well, you know, like the Catholic Church. It's anti-science. And if you think about that, like the only argument that people can give about the church being anti-science anti is Galileo, right? Mm -hmm. Well, what I found out is that the reason why Galileo was called a heretic was because he was not willing to treat Aristotle's uh, theory on the sun being the center of the universe as theory mm -hmm. like he proclaimed it as fact without defending his position so the church was like the the scientists in the church were like whoa, whoa 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 like you can publish any works that you want as long as you accept this is a theory this is not like proved and galileo was like ah i guess i'll just like say that it is true mm. and not provide any proof for it. Mm -hmm. But let's just say that w we take that as, as uh, something that really happened. Like, okay, the Galileo incident, what else you got? Mm -hmm. Usually it stops there. Yeah. But, um, but then you have like seismology, which is basically a Jesuit, uh, field of study uh, or the, the only Jesuit, almost only Jesuits uh, were uh, studying seismology. Mm. Um, they had like a network of um, houses, Jesuit houses around the US where they would like have the same instrumentation in each one of them and they would report information and then send it to Rome. Um, so it was like very well orchestrated information about the movements of the earth uh same thing with like observatories um astronomy mm -hmm. um there are so many craters in the moon named after jesuit mm -hmm. priests which is like mind baffling well the big bang theory right mm -hmm. yes exactly george's lemaitre yep uh was the first proponent mm -hmm. of the big bang theory yeah mm -hmm. and um hubble i think was the guy that got the most no notoriety of it of that proposition but he based a lot of his um theories and studies on the work done by a catholic priest yeah it's so, like um newton had correspondence with a lot of jesuits to to do his work you know um yeah the field of astronomy the field of seism law seismology, law uh, mm -hmm. international law Oddly enough, started because of Saint Bartolomé de las Casas, mm -hmm. who was seeing how like Spaniards were behaving in Hispaniola, which is now Haiti. Mm -hmm. So that like started the basis of international law of how uh, peoples should be treated, and it was always it, it, that kind of like rubbed me the the wrong way because of like how Junipero Serra has been portrayed Correct. lately in this yeah. country. It's ridiculous. Um, and and how like in reality when you read the history it's like you have a spanish dominican monk 
who is trying to say these peoples that um, we are in their in their land, just because they are people created in the image and likeness of God, they have the same dignity, you know. Um, so, anyways, the the basis for like yeah. international law, music too. Yes, I mean we we could stay here like pretty much totally. I mean, music, day. philosophy, obviously, architecture, the empowerment of women. You know, I'm I'm just going through one of the many articles that you can find if you just Google what is the Catholic Church responsible for in terms of like innovations or contributions to mankind. You know. Oodles yeah. of them. Yeah. Oodles. Just Google it. Well, that's the thing. It's like, it's like this is misinformation. But uh, you know what? Uh, uh, a good thing that if, if you don't have a copy of uh, how the Catholic Church built Western civilization, Thomas E. Woods, he quotes secular historians oh, every time go. that he can. Mm -hmm. Which is amazing because then it's not, it's not like we are. It's not biased. Yeah, no estamos llevando agua para nuestro propio molino, which is insane. Um, one last thing that just like blew my mind, um, and this again, this is, you guys know that I'm a Saint Benedict fanboy. Um, he's one of the most prominent, if not the most prominent figure in Western monasticism. Um, the book mentions that um, Monte Cassino. The, the mother house of the Benedictines, and it was sacked by the barbarian Lombards in 589. It was destroyed by the Saracens in 884. It was raised by an earthquake in 1349, pillaged by French troops in 1799, and wrecked by the bombs of World War II in 1942. And each time, the monks returned to rebuild. Mm. they just like won't let it die <laughs> and um and even in in our present age just to to bring it to like right now like maybe a couple years ago in nursia the um, the church where uh saint benedict uh started the benedictine order was destroyed by an earthquake so a group of monks started a new monastery in the in one of the hills in in Norcia. Mm. Um, and uh, following that that story, if you if you haven't checked out the Benedictine monks of Norcia, they have a great album about um, Mary. Um, it's fantastic. All the chants that they have. They also make beer. Birra Norcia is oh. really good as well. Um, so it's just like so many things that we take for granted that if we dig a little bit, we yeah. can find out that the roots are going to be Catholic. And it's coming kind of like full circle to it, right? We as Mexicans, we have like a lot of traditions that we bring over and we carry with us and we're like super proud of, you know, like food or like sports or, you know, whatever, you know, if you're like super into soccer, it's like, yeah, dude, that's like the sport that was created by the Aztecs. You know, you're welcome, world. And, or, I don't know. I mean, I'm not a sports, I'm not a soccer guy, but who was it created by? I think it didn't, doesn't have its roots in England. I don't think so. Soccer? Soccer, no. It's in England. Really? Mm hmm Oh, well, they taught me wrong in school then. No. They told me that the Aztecs used to play with their hip. Well, juego de pelota. Yeah, like, no, it's, people die at the end of it. Yeah, <laughs> yeah, 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 yeah. No football, is, it's it's from England. Oh, there you go. Well, I mean, but I mean, there's point, other things that like. Well, my point originally was the fact that you come back to, you're super proud of the mm -hmm. things that your culture contributed to the world, right? Yeah, like, we like, should be Tuesday. super proud of like. <laughs> I'm pretty exactly. sure LeBron co coined that. <laughs> <laughs> like, we should be super proud and, and knowledgeable about all the things that the Catholic Church provided uh, mankind. And like Mexicans too. Corn, you're welcome, Earth. Mm -hmm. I know. Aguac aguacates, you're welcome. Dude, aguacates. Chocolate, you're welcome, Earth. Tomatoes. Tomatoes. Aguacates is like 
the best thing that's ever happened from to Mexico. the planet. Aguacates is life. <laughs> Aguacates from Mexico. Nice. Yeah. Very good. <laughs> oh. So, okay, like, why is this important? I think what we're trying to, to say here is that our society today is on a rampage to demolish and rebuild everything that has been built over the last two millennia. But it is our duty as Catholics to not forget the truth. Mm -hmm. And uh, again, we are not telling you something that we just like read in a random uh, place of the internet. This is a book that it was made by a scholar. That historian, is right? Yeah, historian. We, he even has like a 13-part video series from EWTN that's available in YouTube. If you don't want to read the book and you just want to watch it, you can do that as well. Um, but I guess it, this is just something that we would like to have you who are listening to just know your history, right? Mm -hmm. Know your, your Catholic church history and how it has affected the way that we live right now and be thankful for that. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So anyways, while you are looking at recipes for compound butter and how to uh, <laughs> rub it under the skin. Under of, the skin. Uh, under the skin, skin is very important. Turkey. Uh, we want to thank you for listening to this episode of Barbatos Catholic Podcast, the show where three Mexican dads talk about faith, life, and culture. If you like the podcast or got something out of this episode, please share it with your friends and family. Subscribe, like, comment, rate, and review if you haven't. If you are feeling extra generous, you can buy us a coffee. Go to buymeacoffee.com slash barbatos and follow the instructions. If you buy us a coffee, you automatically get a shout out in one of our episodes. And if you don't like the podcast, well... Just keep it to yourself and let others make their own mistakes. You can find the show notes for this episode at barbatuscatholicpodcast.com and on social media, we are on Instagram at barbatuscatholicpodcast. Bless us, Alanis Casey. Great for us. Until the next time.